Uh, the session is for folks with an Oracle background who are looking to migrate from Oracle to Postgres, uh, or just anyone who's interested in learning the differences or similarities between the two database engines. Okay. So what we have planned to talk about today is we're going to start off with a quick intro to Postgres, and then we'll compare the differences and similarities between Oracle and Postgres. We'll look at the architecture. We'll look at MVCC, which stands for Multi-Version Concurrency Control. We'll also look at the difference um, in the indexes between Oracle and Postgres, as well as the Postgres extensions, which are used, used to add additional features to your core Postgres um, functionality. And then we'll review some of the common mistakes uh, we see uh, when folks migrate from Oracle to Postgres, and then we'll end with some key takeaways. All right, so let's start with a quick intro to Postgres. So Postgres started as an ingress project at UC Berkeley, led by Michael Stonebreaker. It's written in C and was first released in 1997. And since then, it has been grown to be the most, one of the most popular open source database engines. It's supported in all the major platforms, and it offers a wide variety of support via community or commercial support. And there's a major release every year, and the current version is version 16. So Postgres has a lot of features that are quite on par as commercial database engine like Oracle. It can support HADR, ACID compliance, it can, so it can do ACID um, transactions, partitioning, sports tiered storage, and it uses MVCC where readers don't block writers and writers don't block readers. Also Postgres, you can do online maintenance, you can do log-based or trigger-based replication, so Postgres has a lot of features in store that are on par with commercial database engines. So some folks migrating or thinking to migrate from Oracle to Postgres wonder if Postgres can support large database sizes. So here's a list of maximums that Postgres can support. You can see that Postgres can support a database size of up to 64 zettabytes and a table size up to 32 terabytes. So definitely Postgres can support large databases. But the takeaway here is you shouldn't have to concern yourself um, whether you're going to hit these near maximums, because if you are, you're probably hitting other limitations for hitting the database maximum size. For example, if you had a table size near this capacity, you should probably be partitioning. Or if you have a row size that's near this size, you might be hitting a limitation like the max column size, or maybe you're not using the right data type. All right? So now let's compare the similarities and differences between Oracle and Postgres. So there are some folks who are looking to migrate off of Oracle just due to the high cost or concern for vendor lock-in or just the lack of ability to uh, customize on Oracle. So Postgres has become a popular alternative and folks with the background in Oracle find it an easy transition migrating to Postgres due to a lot of the similarities. So Let's start with the terminology first, because there's some slight differences in the terminology between Oracle and Postgres. So to find a row ID, in Oracle we use the term row ID, where in Postgres it's CTID, which is a tuple identifier. And rows are tuples in Postgres, tables are relations, data blocks in Oracle, where data is stored in pages on Postgres. And for redo, Postgres uses wall, which is write ahead logging, and for undo, multi-version concurrency control. And for SCN, the terminology in Postgres would be LSN, the log sequence number. All right, so now let's get into the comparison of the architecture between Oracle and Postgres. So here we have the architecture, the process and the memory side by side. And you see there's a lot of similarities in the architectural components. So shared buffers is similar to the database buffer cache in Oracle. This is where the data pages are uh, read from disk into memory. Background writer is similar to log writer, or database writer, where it flushes the dirty disk pages to disk. And then we have the wall buffers, which is similar to the redo log buffer. And the wall writer is similar to the log writer, where it flushes the redo logs to disk. 
And then Postgres has a checkpointer process as well as an archiver process that's similar to Oracle's checkpoint and archive process. All right, so let's walk through the Postgres processes. So Postgres utilizes the multi-process architecture, which is similar to Oracle's dedicated server mode. And the three main types of process in Postgres is the postmaster process. It starts off as the primary process. This is the first process that gets launched at a startup. And postmaster spawns the other processes and supervises them and restarts, if, restarts those processes if they fail. And the second one would be the connection, the backend process. And there's a backend process per connection. And these backend processes are the worker process. And its job is to the fetch data and communicate with the client. And then we have the utility backend processes. And those are similar to Oracle's background process, where you have a checkpointer that checkpoints, wall writer that wipes, wall logs the disk, and auto vacuum that cleans up stale data from tables and indexes. So let's walk through the process how a connection is established in Postgres. The first step would be the client initiates a connection, and that connection request is sent to the postmaster. Their authentication would be performed, and postmaster is similar to Oracle's listener process where it listens to connections on a specified port, and then it will spawn a backend process. And from there, the backend process uh, calls back to the client, and then the connection is made. Yeah, uh, with Oracle, you have the share pool, and which you have the dictionary cache, you have the SQL cache, right? So one thing to point out with Postgres is that um, all part of those caches happens at the connection level. So the catalog cache um, is at per connection level, and as well as anything like a prepare statement, that's cache at the connection level. So uh, with that, right, uh, what we can't Imagine as with Postgres, connections is kind of an expense uh, resource, right? Because uh, uh, with the similar to uh, Oracle dedicated server mode, and essentially what it means is a user process uh, will be mapped to a server process on the Postgres site, right? Uh, even though the user process could be uh, idle or doing some processing of uh, business project uh, logics, it's not using or uh, submitting queries, and it's still going to hold a server process uh, on the database side, right? And plus, because of the memory consumptions. So uh, one thing about Postgres performance you want to kind of like optimize for is to manage your connections. And um, we typically recommend using a connection pooling solution on top of Postgres uh, to scale your user connections. And the, the typical type of connection poolers, and there are many that are available out there, either that are community uh, developed, um, like connection pooling solutions like PG Bouncer and third party is PG Pool 2. And also, uh, if you run on AWS, and there is a also a fully managed uh, connection proxy called Amazon RDS proxy that's available. So any one of those uh, will help to enhance connection management when you are running Postgres. Right. Uh, so if you were to ask me what is the uh, single topic that uh, you want to talk about when it comes to Postgres comparing to other database platforms, um, I would say it's MVCC. Um, the way that uh, um, Postgres implements MVCC really impacts a lot of like how uh, it needs to be maintained and it uh, needs to be optimized. So what is MVCC, right? MVCC is multi-version uh, multi concurrency control. And the problem that it's trying to solve is that uh, when you have readers and when you have writers and that are concurrently trying to access a role, then uh, it can result in log conflicts, and which uh, will create blocking. And in the worst case, that locking, which slows down the overall system performance. Right? So what MVCC is trying to solve is that uh, what if the reader and the writer are like, uh, working on their own version of the data? 
So uh, there is no longer uh, like uh, issues with uh, locking, right? Um, or at least minimize um, the chances of locking and to uh, improve concurrency. So the, the concept of uh, MECC is, is not new, and it's common uh, to all uh, relational databases. And however, from an implementation wise, the implementation uh, is uh, very different uh, depending on the uh, different database engine. For Oracle, right, uh, well, before we go into that, um, like step back a little bit. The key implementation uh, differences lies into two areas. Uh, one is that uh, where are the multiple versions of data stored, uh, especially the older version of data? Where do we store it? Right. And the second aspect um, that uh, different databases uh, implements differently is that. Uh, what if uh, we no longer need that version of data anymore? How do we clean it up, right? So uh, those are the two uh, implementation uh, details that uh, different uh, DB engines uh, treat it differently. With Oracle, um, the older versions of uh, the data is stored in the rollback segment, the undo. And um, when an update happens, right, uh, what Oracle does uh, is to move that old version of the data uh, over to uh, the rollback segment. And if we need to recover uh, and read that data again, we can recover, we construct the data uh, from redo. And then we update in pace. Right? Um, and the cleanup of the old version of the data uh, goes along with the uh, undo uh, management. So there's no kind of like anything special that you need to uh, worry about it. And similarly with uh, SQL Server, SQL Server stores uh, um, the, like, um, the versions of data in TempDB and the maintenance goes along with TempDB. Um, however, with uh, Postgres, Postgres is different. Um, Postgres, when an update comes in, right, uh, it always writes a new version. And then it just marks the old version as a dead row in Postgres terms, right, or dead tuple. Um, and uh, that, uh, that, that tuple does not get uh, deleted or removed uh, from a space perspective. Um, and the storage, of that uh, older version happens inside of the data table, right? And later on, a garbage collection process has to come in to clean up that data, make that space available again. So that's special about Postgres. And that's uh, uh, what's kind of like causing um, the side impacts of every other maintenance activities that are special to uh, Postgres that you want to know about. So uh, when it comes to um, tuple visibility, that's driven by uh, transaction IDs. Uh, in Postgres, each row has two system columns, x min and x max. Right? And that determines um, like, uh, if a row is going to be visible to a transaction. If we look at the uh, uh, DML uh, activities and insert, uh, when an insert happens, the X mean gets updated with the transaction ID of the transaction ID created uh, the row. Right? Uh, when a delete happens, X max gets updated uh, with the transaction ID to mark that um, this transaction uh, deleted row. And with an update, update um, essentially we marked um, S max uh, with the transaction ID. And then we also uh, create a new row and mark the X mint with that uh, transaction ID as well. So a row is visible, right? Um, if um, like if you, you look at that uh, equation there, if the, um, like, uh, the, the transaction um, is created or the transaction started uh, after the row is created, or that um, as well as for a row to be uh, visible, uh, it has to be active as well as that it not, has not been deleted or in the process of being deleted. So like, now with the understanding of how the, uh, Postgres manages and implements MVCC, one of the side effects 
um, of MVCC, uh, it's what is called uh, the Broad effect. And anybody heard of uh, Broad in Postgres? Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you ever go into an interview for a Postgres DBA, you want to know what is broad. And you, you, it's a very popular um, like interview question. Right? Uh, essentially, uh, what that means is that uh, um, the uh, database exploded uh, because of the side effect of MVCC if you have a lot of kind of like uh, update and delete uh, on the database eventually your databases and may be occupied us by these like that tuples and it essentially exploded um, the size of your database but this definitely needs to be controlled and managed right um, because like, uh, if you, you don't control it uh, over time, then the, um, the size of the database grows and your performance also tanks. Um, like, I, I once have a customer come to me and says that, well, uh, my query was performing well like, since yesterday, and all of a sudden, like, um, today, it's running two or three times slower. What happened, right? Um, well, it turned out that uh, overnight, um, there was a batch process that uh, did a whole bunch of updates. And uh, all the vacuum, uh, which is the garbage collector, uh, was turned off. And so the size of the data set exploded. And there's a lot of IOs has to be done and process has to be done to get the query returned and that's why the response time was higher. Right? So if you do see that type of performance problems, that's most likely what happens because you have table or index both. And the process to control that or manage that situation, uh, it's vacuum. And vacuum can be run uh, manually, or you can set it to run uh, automatically. So vacuum will reclaim space. So those space can be available for subsequent inserts. Right? However, uh, one thing to know about uh, is that uh, vacuum uh, will reclaim the space for subsequent uh, DML processes. However, it's not actually releasing space back to the OS. Right, which we will talk about how you can um, release the storage space back to the OS uh, later on. So uh, hold that thought for, for, for a little while. And well, so how does uh, vacuum works, right? Without uh, going into uh, the, the details and just very high level, um, vacuum uh, essentially uh, has two main phases. Uh, one is that uh, it has to uh, scan the heap, and uh, I remember all the tuples is essentially is uh, we can look at the, the city IDs, the tuple IDs um, in memory, and so that uh, it can work on those uh, um, like tuples later on. Right? Uh, one of the uh, optimization Postgres does to um, control or like, manage the number of uh, pages that it has to scan through uh, is uh, by using something called the visibility map. So uh, if the visibility map gives uh, like information of which heap pages uh, needs to be cleaned, and so th that, that can reduce the, the uh, amount of pages that it has to scan. Uh, but next thing that um, like vacuum has to do is to vacuum the indexes and the heaps, and then finally uh, it needs is to uh, perform the cleanup and uh, free up the spaces that the, those uh, that tuples uh, used, and also um, this like. Uh, step one to three uh, may needs to be repeated uh, if you don't have enough memory uh, allocated to vacuum to uh, for vacuum to kind of like. Uh, go through this uh, whole things in memory uh, with a single pass and or if your table is too large then it's, it also has to kind of like repeat um, these uh, steps right. now um, like 
one of the key role for vacuum uh, is to uh, clean up those uh, dead tuples, right? Perform gar garbage collection, and, and vacuum also. In addition to that, vacuum also have uh, other very important uh, roles in play uh, in Postgres. Uh, one of the very important thing that uh, vacuum does is update statistics. Well, we all know that uh, query uh, performance is based on statistics, right? So definitely a critical role. Uh, there, and also we talk about the visibility map, and it helps to kind of like uh, improve the uh, the the vacuum uh, process, right? Uh, so it also updates the visibility map, up, up, update the uh, uh, free space map, and then. Uh, Another very important role, which is another concept that is uh, very Postgres uh, specific, is um, to protect Postgres from a transaction wraparound issue. So, specific to Postgres, um, like uh, Postgres has this uh, MVCC implementation, uh, which is based on transaction IDs. Right, each transaction is assigned an ID. So. Uh, maximum that it can support uh, 2 billion IDs in the past and 2 billion IDs in the future, right? Uh, however, if you cross that 2 billion boundary, then the future and the past started to get mixed up and what it means is data corruption, right? Um, so you don't want to get into that situation and the way to avoid that is um, vacuum. Right. So, and Vacuum being so important, right? You definitely want some help to manage it, and so Postgres allow you to uh, enable auto vacuum, uh, which for a vacuum to uh, automatically wake up and run uh, periodically and clean up the data, looks at transaction uh, uh, wraparound issues, and make sure that ha does not happen, right? There are many. Uh, Tuning options that uh, you can make your vacuum run efficiently. Right? Uh, we did talk about earlier about uh, memory. How much memory that you can assign to vacuum to like? Ideally, you wanted to go single pass, and then you have to don't have to repeat right, uh, the vacuum process. And also, uh, you can uh, tune for the number of vacuum workers. Hey, um, in general, uh, like a single worker can work on a single table at any one of any one time. Hey, uh, started with Postgres 13. Uh, Postgres 13 introduced a parallel uh, index vacuum. So, uh, in that, it, it, if you are at that right version, and then if you have a large table, you have multiple indexes on the tables, and you can take advantage of that. Right. And then, uh, how is vacuum trigger? And the way it trigger, uh, it's also something that can be configured. Uh, it can be triggered if, um, like, say, uh, x number of rows has changed on a table, or x percent of rows has changed on the table. Right. There's global settings. And there's uh, table level settings. Right? If of, obviously, if you have a table that is uh, 10 terabytes versus you have um, a table that's 50 megabytes, and the settings will be very different, or you want it to be very different, right? Um, like 10% of a 10 terabyte table is still huge, right? Um, so. Uh, for large tables, uh, you want to look at uh, options at the bottom of the slide and to turn at the table uh, level. You can also control uh, how long vacuum runs by uh, setting the cost limit, right? Because if, if like, uh, uh, you look at uh, the vacuum phases, it does need to scan uh, the table or pages, and it does need to perform like operations on indexes, and those are going to be I/O intensive, and it's going to be overall like uh, resource intensive, right? So if you wanted to reduce the impact of vacuum, uh, you wanted to uh, look at these tuning settings to adjust uh, based on your specific scenario. Right? Um, one worst thing that can do 
is to turn auto vacuum off because uh, like I do have customers who uh, say it's that well we see um, vacuum was the main process uh, that takes o the system resources and cause our queries to go slow so we turn it off well unfortunately it like at that point of time it may seem that like turning off vacuum uh, will make your query run faster because the, uh, there's more resources to the query. However, over time, you will see that your query performance will start to degrade. And over time, the worst case that you can hit is the transaction ID wrap around, um, which if you ever get into that situation, uh, the entire database will become kind of like unreachable, right? So you don't want it to go into that situation. So some of the like best practices of like how do you uh, control uh, the broad uh, of uh, table and index, right? Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a multi kind of like uh, step process. First of all, uh, you do want to have processes uh, running to monitor uh, the table or index road ongoingly to know the both situation. And if it ever goes beyond the kind of percentage that you would expect uh, or you would like it to be, then you will start looking into tuning vacuum and making sure your vacuum is running frequently, is running effectively to uh, manage or keep the percentage blow on your table to um, a preferred percentage, right? And also, if you do get into a situation uh, where you uh, like have a highly uh, rolled table and it's so fragmented, right, as you would wanted to start looking at rebuilding uh, the table. And with uh, the, the rebuilds, either with a rebuild of index, which you have an online option to do it, or that um, you can uh, rebuild the whole table and there is a, a PG repack uh, extension and that allow you to do rebuild online as well. Or uh, if you can take time um, and take the database offline, then you can run vacuum full. Um, to uh, vacuum um, and repack the table. Um, like, uh, with that review operation, uh, you also can release the space back to storage. So that's a way that uh, how you can shrink uh, the size of the database. All right, so let's talk about indexes. So when you migrate your from Oracle to Postgres, there's gonna be some indexes that may not work exactly the same as it did before the migration. So here is a list of uh, some of the common Oracle indexes, um, say, and say the equivalent that you would use in Postgres. So Btree works exactly the same way in Postgres. For composite indexes, if you have that in Oracle, multi-column indexes work very similar. If you have function-based indexes, Postgres has expression indexes. And if you have invisible indexes, there's a Postgres extension that you can use called HypoPG that you can utilize to get the same functionality. So IoT is not supported on Postgres, so then you can use cluster index, which would be similar. And for bitmap indexes, there's a Postgres index that you can consider using called Brin index. All right, so here are a couple popular Postgres indexes. Um, that are available in Postgres that's not available in Oracle. Postgres has a lot more indexes um, to offer. So say you have a GIN index. These are optimal for full text searches, or BRIN indexes are good for time series data. And here's an example of an index, of the GIN index. We can just simply create a GIN index, and here we can run a query, a uh, light query using a wildcard search by just creating an index. We didn't have to implement any complex full search or anything. So the takeaway is when you migrate over, your indexes might not work the same. There are some compatible indexes in Postgres, as well as if the indexes are not in Postgres, there's 
indexes that are very similar. Also, explore the wide variety of indexes that Postgres does offer. So now we'll move into Postgres extensions. So Postgres was designed to be extensible. And Postgres extensions are used to add additional functionality on top of your core Postgres features. Uh, currently, there's over a 1,000 um, extensions that you can utilize, and it's continually added more through the large community support out there. So once you load extensions into your database, it works as just like it was built in. And here is some popular extensions um, that are used from Postgres. For example, if you wanted to add vector search to your database, there's a P PG vector extension. Or say that invisible index that I just spoke about, the hypo PG. All right. So now let's cover some common mistakes we see uh, when Oracle is migrated to Postgres. And the first common mistake is there's a misconception that Oracle applications can't migrate to Postgres because Postgres doesn't support synonyms. Postgres uses a schema search path instead. And what that is is it's like a variable. You add your schema into it, and Postgres will search the objects within that schema order. Okay. Now, um, with Oracle and Postgres, there are a lot of similarities, right? However, uh, something that looks similar uh, may not necessarily uh, perform or behave the same. Uh, one thing to be aware of is how Oracle and Postgres handles nulls. And in Oracle, nulls essentially are equal to empty string. And however, in Postgres, uh, Postgres evaluates a null as a non-value. So what that means is that if you were to do a string concatenation, or um, if you are doing a null comparison, or uh, if uh, you have unique uh, constraints defined on columns that has nulls, you may be, uh, you, after you migrate to Postgres, you may get some unexpected results. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at in the string concatenation scenario, right? Uh, let's look at this specific query and select first name, concatenating middle name, concatenating last name, uh, right? What happens with Oracle? Well, with Oracle, there's uh, 10 rows return. Everything is just uh, nicely as you were to kind of expect it. Um, with Postgres, uh, we have uh, two rows returned. Uh, what happened? Some of the uh, columns has null values, and you cannot concatenate a null value column with um, columns that are string. Right. So how do you deal with this kind of situation? Um, let's look at what we can do uh, on the Postgres side. So uh, there are two options uh, on Postgres to uh, work around these issues. One is to uh, use coalesce, right? So uh, before you do the concatenation, you first uh, uh, do a coalesce. And all that you can actually use um, Postgres native function. Uh, in this case, uh, it's concat underscore ws that will um, do the string concat uh, concatenation for you. Right? So um, there, there are just like uh, different ways of doing it uh, with Postgres, but at the end of the day, um, you just need to be aware of um, these kind of differences. Um, another kind of more challenging uh, part is uh, unique constraints. And so let's say that um, you have a unique constraint uh, defined uh, on middle name. Uh, if you do insert, and uh, uh, multiple inserts, and with the middle name that is now, uh, Oracle uh, will return a unique constraint violation because they are the same as empty strings. And uh, in Postgres, because 
you cannot uh, compare nulls, and null is not equal to null. So, uh, which means that you are not getting a unique constraint violation. Uh, in this case, it's 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 a. Uh, going to be kind of like unexpected, right? Uh, starting uh, with Postgres 15, and Postgres uh, 15 has um, uh, supported a, a keyword uh, that says uh, now uh, not distinct. So when you create your um, unit uh, index, you can specify that keyword, and which allow you to get the same kind of like results that, uh, as, um, that's uh, Oracle-like. All right, so another mistake is migrating from Oracle to Postgres is the conversion of number to numeric. And most migration tools will translate it automatically. And here you can look at number and numeric. They look very similar. You have precision and scale. But if you look at the digits, the details below, Oracle only supports up to 38 digits before the decimal point, where Postgres supports a wide, way bigger number of digits, 131,000. So it's important to know that when you have migration tools that migrate it automatically, go in there and look at your precision of your data type. If you have less than nine before the decimal point, try to use int instead. Or if you have nine to 18 before the decimal point, try to use big int. And this is, the reason for this is the size of this numeric data type affects the storage and performance compared to, say, the number that it's going to move over to for int to numeric. So it's very important to choose the right data type at the start. And another um, advice it would be to never use numeric on your primary keys and your foreign keys. Instead, use big int. Okay. Well, um, both Oracle um, and uh, Postgres has different uh, data types that supports uh, characters, right? Uh, in Postgres, uh, it has text and, uh, for example, text and uh, uh, watch hours. And uh, people look at text and say, oh, that's uh, just um, maybe a whole bunch of character data types, maybe larger data, uh, character data types, right? And Oracle has um, c locked and which is for uh, holding uh, large um, character uh, sets. Right? Uh, so maybe that's uh, uh, equivalent, but it is uh, really not. Right? If you look at uh, uh, Oracle uh, CLOPT, uh, that's a lob data type, and well, worse, uh, SQL Server has text, which is, again, uh, a text uh, character lob data type. And so that, that's why there's so much confusion with Postgres text, right? Um, people just think that it's another lob data type, but it is not a lob data type. And any lob data types will require special operations to get um, like things such as length and to insert into it, all of that, right? But uh, text data type in Postgres is actually identical uh, to uh, watch us. And uh, it behaves um, and you operate uh, the same as watchers. Um, in in fact, um, like. Uh, you can look at text as just um, watch us without a specific length. And uh, with Postgres, uh, watch us are in. Uh, watch us is implemented on top of text. From a performance perspective, uh, text actually has a, a better performance in most cases um, than watch us. So something to be aware of. All right, now we'll talk about migrate uh, exceptions, which is another common mistake. So migration tools mentioned can convert a PL SQL code into PG SQL. And here you can see that the code looks almost identical. You have an exception on the left and on the right. But the, the main point to point out here is Oracle and Postgres handles exception differently. In Postgres, to handle exceptions, Postgres uses subtransactions, which are very expensive and heavy lift in Postgres. It uses a save point, so we can roll back to uh, the save point. And Doing, having a lot of subtransactions, if you have a heavy loaded current database, it'll have a big uh, performance problem. So make sure when you're using a migration tool where 
there's a lot of exceptions used in Oracle that if it's migrated over, take a look and see if the exceptions are actually needed because sometimes they're actually not. Like say if we used the same code earlier, if we moved out the exception um, that raise an exception if there was a null. If you run the same function on Postgres, you'll see that you'll still get a result. Say the first one returns back um, the result of Michael, where the second one returns back a null value. We didn't need to have that exception. So we didn't need to have that extra expense of that subtransaction. All right. Also be aware that Oracle handles exceptions differently in terms of exceptions raised. Like say, for example, Oracle uses that no data found or too many rows. So here we have that function. If we were, instead of to return back a null if it wasn't found, we want to return back not found. But if we run this in Postgres, that exception wouldn't be raised. It returns a null. So if we wanted to have the same um, response that in, like in Oracle, we're going to have to use the keyword strict. And here we see that we do get the result back and no, not found. So make sure if you're using migration tools that um, add the keyword into it and that the exceptions are handled differently. And with Postgres, it's very expensive with the subtransactions. All right. So now we'll end with some key takeaways. Um, as mentioned, Postgres, you can improve your scalability with using connection pooling. And vacuuming is very important to performance. It's the topic that should be looked at. Um, and also, there's some Postgres native features that just aren't available on, Post, uh, on Oracle. So you take, should take a look at the functions, the index types, and utilize that, as well as the extensions that are out there that could ex uh, expand the functionalities to your core. Uh, Postgres features. And the common mistakes that we mentioned with the migration is synonyms. Postgres uses the open search path instead of synonyms with the same behavior. Nulls behave differently between Postgres and Oracle. And there are a lot of data types that, you sh that are converted over using a migration tool. And be sure that you're using the right one with the, um, in terms of storage and performance. And exceptions handled are differently in Postgres. Postgres uses subtransactions, which are very expensive. So remove the exceptions if you are able to. All right. So now we'll have some Q&A if anyone has any questions. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, um, you mentioned in one of the slides that uh, vacuuming full is not recommended. Instead, using PG repack um, or rebuilding index online. Um, so is that mentioned stating, uh, I mean, thinking the Postgres databases uh, uh, when it is a large Postgres database or uh, even for smaller databases, uh, it's not, um, it's the same case. Right. Um, so the, the question is that uh, when we talk about uh, a rebuilding of index using PG Repack or vacuum full, right, to rebuild the table, uh, does it apply to only large databases or does it also apply to small databases, right? So um, the answer is regardless whether or not the database is large or small, it all depending on how broad the data pages. Ah, right. Because even with smaller databases, and if your uh, data is complexly packed, uh, there are less IOs that you need to perform in order to bring the useful data in memory, and the efficiency of memory page will increase, and you can like cache more in memory, and the performance will uh, be better if you do all of those things, right? Yeah. So of course, I, I, I mean, uh, like you, it's not like you have to review all the time, but it's just um, the key thing is to control the percentage of broad. So uh, to make everything um, essentially uh, have a balanced system. Try to meet you halfway and make questions go quickly. Um, number one, real quick, 
um, how widespread is the migration from Oracle to Postgres? And two, where's a good tutorial on managing the roles and permissions and schemas? Okay, um, so the first question is how widespread uh, is the migration from Oracle to Postgres? Um, like uh, being a, a Postgres uh, specialist it, in AWS, and we, we see uh, a lot of like Oracle on-prem to Postgres uh, migration. I mean, uh, the driving factors of it, it's, it's pretty obvious, right? Uh, especially in this economy, and uh, organizations are trying to cut costs. And Oracle licensing is pretty hefty cost. And uh, so that's why uh, open source is becoming popular. And because of the flexibility and ex Densibility of Postgres and the like, kind of large uh, community supports. We do see a lot of like uh, people preferring uh, Postgres as the uh, de facto of uh, open source database. The other quick question is: Does AWS or the open source community have really good tutorials? to manage the roles and permissions? Uh, for roles and permissions yeah, managed? So any tutorial, any guide? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, there, there are uh, a number of like, uh, AWS uh, block process. If you were to kind of search uh, like, uh, AWS blocks uh, on specific to um, the security aspect on uh, um, like, uh, how uh, it manages, for example, uh, IAM authentication, uh, which is uh, specific to AWS, allow you to essentially use this, um, the AWS uh, account to authenticate uh, against your Postgres database. And so, uh, like on Kubo's uh, authentication, which integrations with um, like, uh, AWS manage uh, uh, AD uh, as with your on prem AD, and uh, your, it, there's a lot of like, uh, information uh, on that if you were to kind of interest in AWS. And yeah. There's. Well, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I've used tools in AWS such as uh, DMS to migrate from one Postgres database to another Postgres database. But from an on-premise Oracle database, can we use tools like Golden Gate to replicate data from Oracle to Postgres inside AWS, or is that not possible? It's possible. Okay. So um, DMS, the database migration tool, uh, can work with Oracle as the source and Postgres as the target as well. However, if you already have license for Golden Gate and you prefer Golden Gate over um, like DMS, uh, that's an option as well. So uh, DMS will uh, allow you to perform uh, minimum downtime migration from on-prem Oracle to Postgres uh, on AWS as well, and it's uh, also a log-based uh, replication solution. Okay, thank you. Um, with Golden Gate, I'm able to do bi-directional replication, so I have the option to fail back right. if something goes wrong with the migration. Uh, can DMS do bi-directional replication yet? Yes, oh, uh, yeah. okay. DMS also have uh, options to do uh, bi-directional replication. You um, essentially, it's possible to rep, uh, replicate or like, migrate from A is Oracle, B is uh, Postgres on AWS, and also from B to A. Um, there is uh, options to uh, make sure that it does not do circulate uh, replication. Although, like, we may recommend you to, instead of from doing from A to B, B to A, uh, it will be better off to do from A to B and to C, C as your fallback option. But that, that's the, um, like, the more details that if you are interested, we can take it offline and discuss more. Yeah. 
Uh, is there any extensions that you would recommend for uh, related to performance tuning? Uh, extensions, uh, is there any recommendations uh, we, we will recommend for performance tuning, right? Uh, there are like uh, many extensions that are performance uh, related. Uh, for example, uh, one very popular one uh, is PG stack statements, right? Uh, which allow you to um, uh, look at uh, more details of what has uh, executed, right? Um, there are uh, extensions such as um, like HypoPG, and it, it essentially allow you to do uh, what if analysis uh, for like uh, creating indexes and without kind of actually uh, creating the index and impacting um, the. Uh, the existing queries, and so there, there are many of them, and it just wouldn't be possible for me to name it all here, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.